second half of March 1942. It looks like a slightly spartan railway transit point, some quaint, largish wooden sheds, a lot of green, trees, plants, and flowers among the scattered, rather mundane-looking buildings. There is only a little bit of barbed wire, no long rows of barracks, and no dead bodies lying around. But there's smoke rising in the distance, and a hint of the sweet, pungent smell of burnt flesh in the air. Bevšeč, or Belzec, is not a big camp. But it doesn't need to be. New arrivals aren't going to be staying long. This is War Against Humanity, a sub-series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olsen. In the first half of March, we saw how in Riga, the Dunamunda actions cost the lives of roughly 5,000 Jews. In Burma, thousands of Indians died fleeing from the Japanese occupiers, while in Malaya, many thousands of Singapore's Chinese community were killed in the Sokcheng massacre. In occupied Yugoslavia, the Hungarian massacres were called off, while Italian General Mario Raota issued a memo laying down his fascist colonialist directives for the Balkans occupation. At the end of March, another influential memo on the escalation towards total war is issued. On the 30th, Winston Churchill's confidant and friend, scientist Frederick Lindemann, sends a report to the British cabinet that becomes the de-housing paper. It argues that given access to the proper resources, including a bomber fleet of 10,000, the strategic bombing of Germany's biggest cities could win the British the war within six months. Lindemann has used a survey on damage from German bombs done in Hull and Birmingham earlier in the war. Lindemann's paper states that losing one's home is perceived as worse than losing a loved one. Applying that on a large scale will crush German morale, or, in Lindemann's words, there seems little doubt that this would break the spirit of the people. This paper proves decisive in a heated cabinet debate regarding military resource allocation. In this meeting on the 30th, an increased priority is ultimately given to Harris's de-housing effort. Now, the actual full report studying the effects of the Blitz in Hull and Birmingham is published a week later on April 8th. Contrary to Lindemann's conclusion, it finds that the effect of strategic bombing on morale was limited. Yes, the civilian population was shaken, but far from deterred in supporting the war effort, let alone motivated in any way to revolt against the government. The researchers find, and I quote, no measurable effect on the health of either town. It's not the first time that strategic bombing is put into question. We've seen attempts at bombing people into submission in the Middle East by the British in the 20s, by the Luftwaffe in Spain in 1936, by the Japanese in China since 1938, by the Germans in Poland in 1939, the Soviets in Finland in 39 and 40, the Germans over Great Britain and the USSR. In all of these places, the campaigns have so far not met the expectations. Yes, they have had effect, but not the decisive strategic effect that was expected, not even close. But in a steady war of escalation, the carpets of bombs laid over opponent cities by one side has led to the constant escalation by the opposing side. The Western allies are now the last belligerent to abandon all restraint. They have gone from an absolute interdiction on targeting civilians and civilian targets to targeting infrastructure but limiting civilian casualties as far as possible to a documented decision to target civilians for the sole purpose of killing and torturing them in the hope that this will force their opponent on its back. Just like Goering's campaign over Britain was supposed to do, but never did. The de-housing paper lays down the political decision that was already encapsulated in the Area Bombing Directive shifting British bombers' priority from industrial installations to industry workers and houses issued in February. Bomber Command's new leader, Sir Arthur Harris, has already been implementing this strategy for weeks. In his outspoken ambition to be more effective, deadly, and destructive than ever before, or as he puts it himself, to kill as many Bosch as possible, which he is convinced will win the war for them very soon. The first raid on Essen is made on the 9th of 8th and 9th of March, in which 211 RAF aircraft destroy some houses, killing 10. 
The next night again, another 10 die in Essen and 74 in other towns. Then again, the next night, five more die. The smaller industrial port city of Lübeck is the designated target for the 9th of March 28th to March 29th. The sortie is for 234 Wellington and Stirling bombers that will drop a total of 400 tons of bombs on the medieval city center. First, blockbuster bombs destroy rooftops and general infrastructure. Then, roughly 25,000 incendiary bombs are dropped to set the now unroofed houses ablaze. The wave is set up so that a few squadrons fly ahead to set the first fires and the rest can then follow and hone in on the places that are already burning, indicating that they have found flammable housing. The residential buildings are mostly wooden medieval structures. As they burn, a firestorm soon rages through the historical city center, raising many of the houses and shops. Deaths are limited to 301 that night, as most people manage to find shelter, but it renders 15,000 homeless. The German defense and accidents claim 13 British planes and their crews. Harris will muse that Lübeck was built more like a firelighter than a human habitation. From here on out, the strategic bombing of residential areas in German cities will be a common practice. And once again, the Germans will answer in kind, turning up the scale of human death yet another few notches. But think about what I just said. I said that only 301 people died in Lübeck. That's a large passenger liner full of families wiped out of existence. But such is the scale of this war that deaths that would normally horrify us has become commonplace, everyday occurrences, at least for us who do not live through it. It's undeniable that the source of this blunting of our senses comes from the endless amount of death we're seeing committed hour by hour by the Axis forces in this war. And the rate of that killing is about to become even more stunning in scale. The second Auschwitz camp, Birkenau, is now fully operational. The first arrivals of around 1,000 Soviet POWs are transferred from Auschwitz I, but they are soon joined by others. In the last days of March, the Nazis increased their deportation efforts throughout occupied Europe. On the 26th, 1,000 women from the Slovak transit camp Poprad board the trains headed for Auschwitz. In the remainder of 1942, roughly 57,000 Slovak Jews are deported to extermination camps. Only a few hundred will survive. From the French assembly or transit camp of Drancy, just outside of Paris, deportation to Auschwitz starts on the 27th. The first convoy consists of 1,112 Jewish men. All of them will be put to work in Auschwitz after arrival, but only 22 will survive the war. Drancy will be the point from which over 60,000 French Jews will be deported to Auschwitz. It's all part of the operations to exterminate all of Europe's Jews ordered by German Führer Adolf Hitler on December 12, 1941 and outlined in detail at the Wannsee Conference in January. The instigator of the operation and head of the SS security police, Reinhard Heydrich, has appointed Odolo Globocznik, SS and police leader of the Jublin district, to lead the operations. Globocznik is a veteran of mass murder. Already two full months before Hitler's fateful meeting at the Chancellery, Globocznik was given verbal directions by Heydrich and Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler to exterminate the 2,284,000 Jews in the Generalgouvernement in Poland. Globocznik has now assembled 92 veterans of the Action Tierfia Euthanasia program as experts in deception and extermination, and an inner staff of 358 SS and policemen. Already before the formal orders were passed down, he began the planning of deportation and extermination methods and oversaw the beginning of construction on the death camps. One by one, these camps now come online. Auschwitz-Birkenau and Sobibor are joined by Belzec on March 17th. 
The first victims are 30,000 Jews from the Yublin ghetto. In three weeks, 30,000 Jews from the Lvov district are taken there too. Within four weeks, roughly 75,000 Jewish Poles in total are taken to Belzec. This is what happens to them. They arrive in highly packed, unhygienic, suffocating, dark freight wagons, rank with the scent of human sweat, urine, excrement, and fear. The train stops at a railway ramp fit to accommodate 20 railway cars. The rails continue so it looks like a station. What the arrivals don't see is that the rails end in nothing 500 meters further on. It's only to create a false sensation that this is not the final destination. The camp is not big, only roughly 275 by 265 meters, but the people wouldn't realize that as they are given no time to look around. The SS guards unpack and hurry them along at a running pace, all in the same direction away from the trains. I'll let the account of Waffen-SS hygienist Professor Wilhelm Pfannstiel take it from here. There were men, women, and children of every age. They were ordered to get into line and then had to proceed to an assembly area and take off their shoes. The SS escorts took up guard positions outside the camp and Jewish functionaries from the camp gave the arriving transports to understand that they would now be examined and instructed them to undress so that they could be deloused and take a bath. They also told them that they had to inhale in a certain room to prevent them from passing on any illnesses through their respiratory tracts. After the Jews had removed their shoes, they were separated by sex. The women went together with the children into a hut. Their hair was shorn and then they had to get undressed. The men went into another hut where they received the same treatment. I saw what happened in the women's hut with my own eyes. After they had undressed, the whole procedure went fairly quickly. They ran naked from the hut through a hedge into the actual extermination center. The whole extermination center looked just like a normal delousing institution. In front of the building, there were pots of geraniums and a sign saying Hackenholt Foundation, above which there was a Star of David. The building was brightly and pleasantly painted so as to not suggest that people would be killed here. From what I saw, I do not believe that the people who had just arrived had any idea of what would happen to them. Inside the building, the Jews had to enter chambers into which was channeled the exhaust of a 250 horsepower engine. In it, there were six such extermination chambers. They were windowless, had electric lights and two doors. People were led from a corridor into the chambers through an ordinary airtight door with bolts. There was a glass peephole next to the door in the wall. After a short time, the glass became steamed up. When the people had been locked up in the room, the motor was switched on. Once the engine was running, the light in the chambers was switched off. This was followed by palpable disquiet in the chamber. In my view, it was only then that the people sensed something else was in store for them. It seemed to me that behind the thick walls and door, there were prayers and shouting for help. After about 12 minutes, it became silent in the chambers. The Jewish personnel opened the doors leading outside and pulled the bodies out of the chambers with long hooks. To do this, they had to put these hooks in the mouths of the bodies. In front of the building, they were once again thoroughly examined and the body orifices were searched for valuables. Gold teeth were ripped out and collected in tins. The bodies were taken from the searching area directly and thrown into deep mass graves, which were situated near the extermination institute. When the graves were fairly full, petrol was poured over the bodies and they were then set alight. A factory to kill 75,000 human beings in four weeks. Men, women and children with dreams, hopes and plans for the future. Memories of love, laughter, loss and tears suffocated in 12 minutes of grueling horror. Over 50 families murdered and their corpses desecrated every hour for 12 hours a day in a machine not yet even running at its highest capacity, and only the third of its kind, with many more in construction. Never forget. <laughs> ¶¶